Hello, and welcome to Smart Online Selling Across Borders webinar. My name is Alex Wyatt, and I am the head of the business development here at simplyvat.com. Today, I have the pleasure in hosting the webinar, and I'm joined by Chad Rubin from Scubana, Richard Gilbert from Payoneer, and Claire Taylor from Simply VAT. We will be answering questions throughout the presentation and at the end, so if you have a question, uh, please put it in the question box, and if we don't get to your question, we'll be sure to follow up after the holiday break. We have also added in a few interactive poll questions, so please feel free to take part through it. So first off, we have uh, Chad from Scubana. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining the call today, taking time out of your day to come join us, uh, an hour out of your day to come join us and, and sharing our knowledge of how we've scaled or how I've scaled internationally. Uh, so right now, based on what I'm seeing, it looks like 71% of the people on this today are in the United States, which is great because I'm actually in the United States as well. Uh, I would love for my presentation to be as interactive as possible. So if you have questions, if you have comments, if you want to just shout out, let me know where you're, where you're dialing in from, that would be great. Uh, so let's get started. So a little bit about myself. Uh, started selling on Amazon in 2009. Uh, my parents had a vacuum store. Uh, they were going out of business. And I was on Wall Street working a job that I didn't like, uh, and so I decided to make, make the leap into starting my own direct consumer business. This was back in the day before private label selling was really the in thing to do. And uh, have scaled that business significantly to be in the top 500 seller on Amazon, but have also scaled uh, internationally as well. So for me, I'm selling not only in Amazon US, both as Merchant Fulfilled and FBA, but I'm also selling uh, Amazon Canada. Amazon Germany, Amazon UK, uh, along with 20 other marketplaces like Walmart, Jet, eBay, Sears, Rakuten, Newegg, Overstock, Wayfair, etc. So let's see. I want to make sure that people are chatting. If they, if, if people want to just be again, I want this to be interactive. So if you have any questions, if I stutter or I mumble, or if you want sort of to get more clarity based on what I'm saying, please feel free to put it in the chat box. I'm writing hello right now in the chat box. And again, please feel free. So out of my own e-commerce business, I couldn't find a software to run my business. So I started a software called Stubana, which is an operational system. Everything you need to run your business after checkout, really built for high volume sellers. For me, I was doing 60,000 orders a day and I couldn't find an all-in-one solution to manage my business and automate it. So orders, inventory, purchase order management with algorithms and analytics to really dive into the hidden fees of selling across other channels. So as somebody who's been a seller for quite a long time, uh, I've also have had to deal with issues online, such as being suspended. And so I'll tell you that when I first started, I was 100% focused just on Amazon alone. And uh, I got suspended and quickly realized the need to diversify. So first, my approach was really starting to diversify domestically, and then I found that there, there was life outside of the United States, a massive market. So I just want to underline with this slide how, it is, how important it is to diversify. Not just because you don't want to just have one business or one channel you sell on. I look at Amazon as a channel, not as a business. Uh, I also wanted to make sure that I had an exit strategy ahead of this. So my strategy was to actually uh, exit my business, my own e-commerce business, and you'll get a much higher premium for your business if you're selling internationally. All right, so diversification is key. Amazon translation. So for me, I wasn't sure I'm, I'm the right way to scale. I knew that there was a right market outside the United States to scale onto. And my initial, my initial instinct was actually to have Google translate my listings. And if you look at this, this really simple example here, uh, these, where I write in English with Google, these shoes are comfortable, versatile, and simply to die for. If you look at the translation into French, and then you take that French translation and then put it back into English, you'll see that it says these shoes are comfortable and quite simply to die. So the translation isn't up to speed. And so when I look at selling internationally, I think selling internationally is extremely hard to do. But when you're doing it, you need to make sure you're doing it right. 
And when you're doing it right, that's the way you're going to actually win and get the market share on the international platform. So the way, instead of being sort of stepping over a dollar to pick a penny, would be to actually use Google Translate. But the next best approach is to find somebody that's a professional that can actually translate your listings for you and make it best practice. Another example would be vacuum bags. Vacuum bags in the United States translate in the United, United Kingdom as Hoover bags, even though Hoover is a brand here in the United States. So just make sure that your listings are spot on and that you're spending a lot of time building that content and make it relatable in the market that you're selling into. All right, let's move on to the next slide. So a lot of customers are always asking the question is, well, do I build a warehouse internationally or what is the right pro approach to actually expanding outside the United States? For me, it's all about going after low-hanging fruit. You don't need to build a warehouse with boots on the ground. You could actually get your product to be FBA, and if you're a private label seller, you can get it directly from Asia, directly to the FBA warehouse. And then you can use a system like Subana or another system to do the multi-channel fulfillment. So if the inventory uh, is sold off Amazon internationally, you can use your Amazon stock that's sitting at FBA to ship it to your quote unquote off channel customer. So hopefully that's very clear for everybody. It's a really great way to test the market, to get your product into FBA, and then start launching your product Amazon or eBay International, eBay, uh, eBay UK. Like I'm pretty sure the market share between eBay UK and Amazon UK, at least right now, are pretty even. So you can actually get a ton of sales eBay UK using your stock that's sitting in fulfillment by Amazon in the Amazon International Warehouse. So you don't need to have boots on the ground is the underlying theme here. Okay, let's move on. So the other approach, and this is the approach that I use, I can use a personal share, is that I actually started using FBA International and realized it was actually a little bit expensive, but it was a great way to test the market. And then I started using an outsourced 3PL. Uh, there's a term called wise loads that I use. I think they're great. If you want a warm introduction, please feel free to email me after this, and I'll be happy to make a nice introduction for you. But there's a many reasons why you'd want to use a 3PL. You don't want to build a warehouse because building a warehouse means extra headaches, extra costs, increased payroll, and a lot of the things that happen internationally are outside of your control, unless you want to continuously take trips internationally and write them off as, as a business expense. You need to really focus on growing your business versus working in your business. And so by using an international 3PL, you could actually take all those costs, all those headaches, and actually alleviate yourself from that so you can focus on building quality listings that are built to sell and built to convert on other channels. So this slide here, uh, is interesting. Typically when I ask sellers where they want to start selling, the question is, is well, where do I start? People start asking questions like, well, should I start in Canada? Should I start in Germany? Should I start in the UK? The UK must be the biggest. And in fact, if you actually look at what Amazon reports in their earnings, Amazon Germany is the biggest, uh, next biggest channel off of Amazon.com. So Amazon.de is a great place to start. But I want to also mention that if you're in a competitive space today and you're selling internationally right now or you're not selling internationally, you want to go to where the puck is going. A lot of your competitors are not selling abroad because it's hard. It actually is hard work to sell abroad. You need to translate your listings. You need to invest more dollars. You need to actually problem solve and find out how you're going to ship your stuff uh, and which channel you're going to go to, and who's going to do the logistics, and how do you pay that, and how do you do the currency conversion, all the things that we're going to talk about with simply that and pay in here. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to start up a poll question, and we're going to start asking about, let's see, what percentage of, of your sales are in the United States versus abroad? So feel free to answer, guys. 80%, look at this, 80% I'm seeing right now, mostly United States. 
87 percent. Looks like we're we, we're held holding steady at 88, 87. Votes are continuously coming in. The way to win right now is to do what your competitors are not doing. So if you, if most of the people on this call right now are mostly United States, I guarantee you that we're going to see a mirror reflection of these same results if we ask your competitors the same thing. So I think a takeaway from this, guys, is you need to start thinking about how else can I diversify my revenue, diversify my channels, diversify what I'm selling, and right now we're in, a, in an environment where it's first come, first serve. So I look at internationally as being extremely important to winning because there is life outside the United States, but I'm also looking at other marketplaces. For example, Walmart. So Walmart's marketplace is 1% of the seller size of Amazon's. It's ripe for the taking. So if you're not even on Walmart, you should start thinking about these other channels. You need to diversify. Diversification is key. So we landed at about 86% of the people on this call are mostly, most of their revenue is in the United States. I'm going to close out the poll. Profitability. So when you log into Seller Central, whether it's in the United States or whether it's abroad, Amazon only cares about what you make. Your settlement reports, uh, what they show you is all top line oriented. But if you want to win, Again, my, my, my slides are all about what am I doing to make sure that I'm winning, not only selling internationally or domestically, but internationally. So one of the things that I spend a lot of time looking at is profitability. Seller Central won't report you these things. There's a lot of fees that happen on Amazon that no one's paying attention to. So your pick fee that's on FBA, your pack fees, your storage fees, your long-term fees, your removal fees, your return commissions, all these things are adding up and taking away from what you keep. Not what you make, what you keep. These are things that Amazon doesn't really want. Amazon wants people to compete for that buy box. So for me, as a seller, I want to know what I'm keeping at the end of the day. So these are things that you need to think about. You need to find a software. If we scroll to the next slide, you need to find a tech stack and a software that not only supports Amazon domestic, that supports you for future growth. Not just a one trick pony that just supports one channel. You want to find a software that supports every single channel you sell on. So this is actually some live data from my back end where I'm looking at it and I want to see what my profit is per SKU across every single channel. Whether it's Amazon US FBA or whether it's Amazon Germany FBA or whether it's Walmart. Each channel is contributing to the bottom line of my margin. And what I'm focusing on right now is I, I actually play with these numbers at the top. And I'll, I'll change the date range, and I'll give my team instructions, and they'll say, I want to increase my unit margin per item. If it's on FBA, let's just say it was 25 cents. I want to 3x that. Your mission for this next month is to increase my margin three times. And that obviously inevitably has an impact on my net profit. So make sure that you're looking at the fees because the fees on Amazon US versus the pick and pack fees on Amazon Germany and UK are different and you have to start examining where those fees are going to and how you can start making more money. If you guys are interested, uh, there is I could have a consulting session, it's a power offer where I'll select 10 people from this to actually join me for a free consulting session for 15 minutes. I believe the, the link is scubana.com slash gold, and then the password is nuggets, but, but please feel free to move on. My name's Claire Taylor, um, and I'm from simplyvat.com, and um, we provide international VAT compliance services which enable online retailers to trade internationally and compliantly, and I'm going to um, spend um, 15 minutes really talking you through the main rules and regulations that are going to affect you as the online sellers coming into Europe. So I'm um, going to set the scene. It's actually um, 20 years since the first recorded online transaction, only 20 years, which apparently was a Sting CD bought for $12 on something called NetMarket, which I don't think is still around. I haven't heard its name lately. Um, but since that time, online sales um, have just grown phenomenally. 
18 trillion pounds last year sold online globally. It, it's quite phenomenal. Europe itself is a really attractive market for online sellers to get into. Um, sales last year, online sales in Europe were um, 500 billion euros and that's a 12% increase year on year and it, it is increasing all the time. So that's 296 million shoppers spending on average 1,500 euros a year, which is roughly the same equivalent um, as dollars. UK, France and Germany, as Chad was saying, really um, Germany um, and the UK are the most mature e-commerce markets. These three countries account for 60% of the lot online sales um, in the European market. So it really is a huge opportunity for you, the online retailer, to increase your profits by um, tapping into these markets. So there's obviously more to think about when you're selling abroad. There's obvious language um, differences, um, but also, as Chad was saying, about issues with translation. But there's also not the so obvious cultural nuances, such as differences in payment method preferences. For example, Germans like a bank transfer, whereas we in the UK, we much prefer PayPal, for example. So there's also the rules and regulations that um, surround um, selling online, international VAT rules and regulations. So we find people don't even know that they've got that obligation or indeed they don't actually want to know. But it's really important for you guys to know about these rules because this knowledge will breathe longevity into your business going forward. So usual response when we start talking about VAT is um, head down in the sand and this can work for a while but it's not a permanent solution. So what does the online retailer need to think about? What actually are the different rules and regulations? I'm going to set the scene first of all with um, start explaining to you what VAT is. It's really important to put it in context so you understand why you have to pay it, but also more importantly, understand why the tax authorities will want to know if you're not paying it. So the clues in the name, um, VAT stands for Value Added Tax, and VAT gets charged whenever value is added in the supply chain. For example, from the raw material supplier to the manufacturer, VAT is added on that transaction, then from the manufacturer, to the wholesaler, to the retailer, and then on to the final customer. In Europe, um, which is quite shocking to you guys in the States, um, VAT um, percentages range from 17 to 27% across the different countries in the EU. But both inside and outside the EU, it's a favourite for the tax authorities. And the reason for this is governments get revenue every step of the supply chain. So it's a really popular tax to implement. But it's not supposed to be a burden to businesses, as any VAT collected on sales is offset against VAT paid, if, um, if you're VAT registered, of course. The final burden is um, with the customer, with the consumer, and it's for this reason that the tax authorities are really focusing their attention on the e-commerce, on the online sales that you guys are making, because the VAT paid to you, collected by you, by the customer to pay over to the tax authorities is revenue that the tax authorities don't have to pay back. So. That's really setting the scene. Just to um, look firstly, then at what happens. So if you're outside the EU and you want to get your goods into the EU, um, you need to um, work out who the importer of record is. Now this is important because the importer of record is responsible for paying the import VAT that will get charged as soon as the goods enter Europe, unless of course your goods are below the low value consignment release threshold, which is £15 in the UK, but we can um, cover that um, at another time. So if, you're, if your goods are coming into the EU, you'll get charged import VAT. But if, for example, you've been selling into Europe and haven't really worried about the import taxes and duties, chances are that the customer is accounting for the VAT, but it's not always the best customer experience. Um, before the goods get delivered to you, um, to the consumer in Europe, any import duties and VAT have to be paid, and this is usually managed by, say, the courier company like DHL. 
So the customers sat there waiting for their goods to turn up and they'll get an email stating that they have to pay maybe another extra £20 import charges before the goods get delivered. So it can be unexpected and annoying for the customer and um, most times can negate the reason for buying overseas in the first place. So sellers can experience high volumes of returns. But if you as the seller um, become the importer of record, um, you would register for VAT, make sure the goods get delivered, get sent, um, delivered, duty paid, and all the uh, taxes are accounted for and the customer doesn't get any unpleasant surprises. And the cost of compliance to become the importer of record then far, um, is far outweighed by the drop in number of returns and repeat business that you get from your customers. So if you um, want to be the importer of record, what do you have to do? Well, the first thing you have to do is get an EORI number, and this stands for Economic Operator Registration Identification Number, and it's unique. It's a number issued by EU Customs and is unique to each importer. Um, so it identifies you as importer as the goods come into the country and you must put the EORI number on your import documents to identify you as the importer. So when your goods are imported and the VAT um, import VAT is charged at the first port of entry, it's going to get charged at the local VAT rate. So for example, in the UK, it's 20% and it's charged on the cost value of the goods plus freight and insurance costs. And if you're VAT registered, this gets refunded to you through the VAT return, but as long as you've got your valid EORI number on the import documents. I can't stress that enough. So your goods are in the, in the EU. Say you're choosing to put your goods into a 3PL, such as Wise Loads um, or the Amazon um, FBA centres. So the first really important piece of VAT legislation you've got to be aware of is that the, the goods stored in that EU country for onward sale to private consumers has triggered an immediate need for you to VAT register there. As a non-resident in that EU country, there are no thresholds to exceed. So if you guys are using Amazon, um, the Amazon fulfillment services, which range from the European Fulfillment Network, where you would have your stock in one country, to maybe the new Pan EU service, where your stock could be held in seven countries, um, that's quite a hefty VAT compliance obligation you now have because your stock is there. So your goods are in the fulfillment centre, and then any sales that are delivered from that stock comes under what's known as the distant selling rules. Now these rules apply to you even if you're not VAT registered. Um, you're not registered business, you might be in your bedroom thinking you're, you don't even class yourself as, as trading, for example. They also apply to you if you use the marketplaces such as Amazon and eBay. And you've got to be fully aware that the marketplaces do not um, take on the responsibility of, of paying the VAT on your behalf. Um, and also these rules only apply to your sales to EU customers. They don't apply if you've got stock, say, in the UK and you're sending it out, for, um, delivering maybe um, to customers outside the EU, these rules don't apply to those sales. So what are these rules exactly? Well, they state that you charge or you account for the VAT locally in that EU country until you hit set thresholds in the other EU countries which the tax authorities have set. Now these thresholds, 35,000 euros in most countries, which is approximately the same in dollars at the moment, except for Germany, Netherlands and Luxembourg, where it's 100,000 um, euros, and again roughly $105,000. Um, and then the UK, say you've got your stock in Amazon.de, selling from Germany to UK customers, the UK um, tax authorities, we have a distant selling threshold of £70,000. Um, so you can access all the 28 EU countries from just, say, one EU location. You'd have a VAT registration, say, in the UK, in terms of, of VAT compliance. And this is what we usually recommend to sellers is the best way to start to test the EU market without the heavy cost of compliance in terms of um, resources or cost. 
If you don't register, the tax authorities are going to issue penalties and interest payments for late or non-compliance. So really put it in perspective, if you're selling, especially if you're selling medium to high value goods, it's not going to take much to breach those thresholds in a lot of the EU countries. And just another um, point about um, selling in the, or VAT registering in the EU. Um, in some EU countries, um, and I'm thinking primarily, of, you know, the Amazon kind of hotspots like Italy, France, and now Poland, um, some EU countries require non-EU companies to have a fiscal representative in place. Now, a fiscal rep is somebody who's jointly liable for the VAT that you owe, and because of this exposure to risk, they often want a bank guarantee in place, and the cost the cost uh, can be quite high. One way to um, avoid this is to set up a company in the EU, say it's really easy in the UK, um, you'd have different reporting requirements like annual accounts for example, um, and you'd have to re, um, pay corporation tax in that country, but it can avoid the fiscal rep costs and it avoids their obligations, so it's something to think about. It's about doing the sums and see, see, you know, see what fits your business model. So just in terms of the VAT compliance, I really want to put this, um, push this issue to you guys just to understand that these days you can't go under the radar anymore of, of getting away with maybe not being VAT compliant. Um, the tax authorities are really getting much more savvy about it all. A, a phenomenal amount of money is lost in the EU because of undeclared VAT from online sales. It was nearly £2 billion in 2011 and it hasn't got much better. And they reckon in the UK £10 billion is lost a year from non-compliant, um, non-EU sellers. So the tax authorities are really honing in on this. They've got specialist units, they um, share data, they talk to each other, but more importantly, they go to the marketplaces and, and get the information on who's selling what. Um, so just examples of this recently, I know um, those of our clients who are registered in, fr um, in France, or, or actually some who aren't, but we've got some Amazon sellers um, on our books who um, are coming to us, and they've all of a sudden received an annual statement from Amazon who have been um, obliged to do this by the French tax authority to give the sellers ex um, exposure on what, they, what their VAT exposure is in France. Um, so they're collecting data all the time and they will start coming to you to get you to register if you, if you need to. Germany, last year the German tax authorities went to Amazon and asked for seller data. So we have, um, have had a rush on German VAT um, registrations recently. And the UK, there's been a massive amount of lobbying in the UK by the um, UK sellers um, who, you know, can't compete when they have to charge VAT on their sales. So the UK Tax Authority has issued new laws um, and they'll make um, Amazon and fulfillment, um, fulfillment houses responsible for understanding that the seller is compliant and especially Amazon, if they don't get the right VAT number from the seller, they can shut your store down within 30 days. So um, really to summarize, um, we would say do your homework when you're thinking about trading internationally. You really need to understand that there's a cost um, to VAT compliance, whether it's like an internal cost of language capability or IT alignment with the various tax authorities, or obviously using companies such as ourselves. Um, to take on the compliance process for you, but you need to factor it in along with other staples in your cash flow these days, like your web hosting or your Amazon FBA fees or accountancy fees. Um, planning and preparation is a vital part of the journey, um, but many many businesses, as Chad was saying, you know, there's opportunity out there. Um, the European market is really receptive and ready ready to. Um, you know, kind of really exploit the opportunities for actually buying online for you guys to sell to them. So those who've already made the leap to international expansion find the cost of compliance is far outweighed by the increased sales and profit. So with the right information and right strategies, European Union VAT does not have to be a barrier to your international expansion plans at all. Um, and obviously we can help you um, 
we can provide international VAT registrations and returns in all the EU countries and we've got relationships such as these guys today, partners that we work with and we can help our clients um, with contacts in other areas of the e-commerce supply chain but ultimately we're absolutely here to help and we really want to help you sleep at night so stop that niggling in the back of your head that the VAT needs to be dealt with as soon as possible. So thank you. Hello everyone. Uh, so quick question for everyone if we, if we would. Um, we're interested in understanding how much uh, monthly volume in dollars uh, you're selling internationally. Uh, from not selling yet to less than 10K, less than $50,000, less than $100,000 a month or over $100,000 a month. And the answers are coming in. So hovering around 40% of you aren't selling yet but considering selling internationally. Uh, the next largest 20% of you are over 100000 a month. So clearly those of you that are in the in those categories are meeting the uh, thresholds that Claire referred to earlier. Okay, so almost all the votes are in now. So yeah, about 39% not selling yet. 16% um, of you said less than 10K per month, another 16% 50K per month, and 9% less than 100,000, and 20% over 100K. Thank you. All right, so I'm Richard Gilbert, uh, and thank you again for joining um, our, our webinar today. And uh, I'm with Payoneer. We're a cross-border payments company. Uh, my email is attached here, richardgi at payoneer.com. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those questions. Payoneer at a glance. Uh, we're really we're a pretty big company globally. Uh, we have, we're have we probably the largest provider of currency conversion solutions for uh, Amazon sellers. We have over 45,000 active Amazon sellers on our platform today. We support over 150 currencies. Um, we um, can support, um, we have over 3 million account holders uh, on our platform today. And we facilitate these conversions through our corresponding banking relations. We have 46 and growing banking relations uh, all across the globe to enable our ability to uh, facilitate these currency conversions. As I alluded, we're a, a global company. Uh, we have nearly 1,000 employees spread across 13 offices in 10 different countries. Uh, New York City, where I'm speaking from, is our corporate headquarters. Uh, our base of operations is in Tel Aviv, Israel, and our third operational hub is in Hong Kong. We have two core elements to our business. Uh, the first is our mass payouts business, which is effectively a wholesale payouts business. Um, where we target companies that have to make payouts of over 100,000 uh, per month uh, in international payments. Uh, we specialize in marketplaces and have focused on certain verticals, e-commerce in particular, as well as the freelance vertical, digital marketing, vacation rental, stock photography. Um, as you can see with the e-commerce marketplaces, we have integrations or are partnered with many of the major marketplaces, Amazon in particular, we, get, we actually facilitate the payouts to 25 currencies across the globe that Amazon does not support. My team uh, represents the reciprocal of that business, which essentially is all of the participants who are active in those marketplaces, sellers in this case. Uh, in fact, we are, my team is exclusively focused on Amazon sellers who wish to sell on international marketplaces. Uh, utilizing Payoneer, we can help those international sellers collect their international earnings we can help them um, not only collect but also pay their international suppliers utilizing their Payoneer accounts. And then lastly, we can help them grow. With the partnerships that I mentioned before with the various other marketplaces, we can actually make introductions and help leverage the integrations that we have with those other marketplaces, enabling um, our sellers to go multi-platform, as Chad described earlier. Our solution is, is pretty... Um, uh, pretty uh, robust. We, we have, um, we enable SMBs to sort of collect their foreign earnings, earnings four different ways. First of all, we enable the SMB, our, our sellers, with virtual bank accounts uh, in, in various local currencies so that you can collect from international marketplaces. You can also actually receive local currency from a business in that particular currency. Uh, you, you can invoice your foreign clients and collect funds that way internationally. And then also we have another uh, unique feature which we call pay with Payoneer, or, uh, 
to be make a payment where you can actually pay uh, other Payoneer account holders uh, for free. You can use your earnings uh, four different ways as well. The most popular, obviously, is transferring your uh, foreign funds back to your local bank, your U.S. bank. We also it can issue you a uh, MasterCard debit card. You can use that debit card to withdraw funds to an ATM, or you can actually make online purchases with that card. And then, of course, as we described before, uh, make a payment, being able to pay your uh, other Payoneer account holders for free. Um, when, when you all signed up and someone had asked a question um, about um, you know, any sort of supplementary processes and services needed in addition to Amazon for the FBA payment system, uh, I'm going to try to address that question in this next session, uh, but essentially this will talk about how you use your Payoneer accounts to collect funds from Amazon. Uh, one of the great, you know, equalizers and one of the great features of Amazon and they, that they make it so frictionless to go international is they provide the ability for uh, sellers to actually sell and collect funds internationally. What I mean by that is Amazon is acting as the merchant of record and they're actually transacting and collecting in those local funds, be it you know, the euro or the British pound sterling or any other foreign currency where Amazon operates. Um, the way we help international sellers is we basically provide them with the ability to collect their funds from the Amazon account and transfer those back. Amazon actually provides you with th three different options. Uh, if let's just say we're selling in Amazon UK, um, the first option you can actually have Amazon do the conversion for you. So every 14 days when Amazon uh, prepares to send you your funds, you can actually have them convert your British pound sterling. Uh, to your U.S. bank. Uh, this service is called Amazon Currency Converter for Sellers. Uh, alternatively, you can actually go over to the U.K. and establish an entity and open up your own bank account. And then lastly, uh, you can use a third-party provider like Payoneer, where we basically provide you with a virtual bank account and the ability to be able to collect funds locally. That virtual bank is a partnership that we have in the, in the case of the UK with Barclays Bank. So we actually issue you a Barclays Bank account number for you to collect your funds locally in that currency. So this is a, um, this is a, a screenshot of the My Account portal when you first uh, enter into uh, Payoneer. Uh, we provide five uh, local, or, or vir local currencies or virtual accounts, um, the US dollar, uh, the euro, the British pound sterling, Japanese yen, and the Chinese yuan. Uh, we'll also be launching the Canadian dollar soon, along with the Mexican peso and Australian dollar uh, sometime later this year. The global payment service, the first icon that's been highlighted below, is how you sort of access and look at your different account balances. So depending on which accounts you've, you've connected to uh, your Amazon account, you can actually see um, the loads when they occur. Uh, from Amazon to your um, virtual bank account. Uh, in addition to that, we also have the withdraw to bank um, as well as the ability to sort of look at your transactional history. If I were to click on that particular um, on that particular uh, icon, the global payment service icon, you can actually see the details of your bank. In this case, we're showing the uh, bank account that this account holder has for their USD balance, their, which is a bank with uh, Bank of America. You can actually take that information, and this is how you actually go into sell, your Seller Central account. You can opt out of ACCS, Amazon Currency Converter Service, and you can select your own bank details. You could use the bank details that we provide for you uh, in that screen before and actually load in the information. Here in this case, we're showing the example of the Barclays Bank account number that you would load in. Uh, to delineate your account, uh, so Amazon will send the funds directly to that account every 14 days. Another question um, that was asked uh, from one of you who signed up um, was, how can I use my, uh, my Payoneer accounts to actually pay Chinese suppliers, which is a very popular use case. Many Amazon sellers do rely on uh, Chinese manufacturers and suppliers, um, especially those that are private labelers. Uh, in this section, I'll describe uh, some of the ways in which you can actually pay your international suppliers as well as use your funds else, elsewhere. So using your pay in your account. Uh, the most common use case, obviously, is the ability to withdraw your funds anytime uh, to your U.S. bank. 
I uh, want to make it clear our business model is predicated on a transaction fee. We do not make any money at all on the uh, on the FX conversion, other than the standard transfer fee of two percent, and that fee goes down over time. Uh, some of our multi-million dollar sellers have transaction fees of one or even less than one percent. We also uh, provide a, uh, a a Mastercard debit card for sellers who wish to have one. It's a very popular option. It provides with additional flexibility of being able to use your funds. So you can uh, request a, a UK British pound sterling Mastercard debit card as well as a Euro based Mastercard and you can uh, make payments utilizing that card be it online payments or withdrawing the funds from uh, from an ATM uh, in that market or paying your suppliers. The um, other feature that's been increasingly popular, I mentioned before we have over 3 million account holders and growing, probably closer to 4 million at this point. Um, our strategy is to really grow our ecosystem and, our, and the network effect associated with using Payoneer. Uh, so the ability to be able to um, pay anyone who has a Payoneer account and avoid the transaction fee is a, a very popular feature. Uh, we have uh, thousands of Chinese suppliers on our platform, uh, as well as a, a, a large China team um, that is able to support and work with our U.S. sellers who wish to recruit or onboard Chinese suppliers in order to make a payment and utilize this feature. And the newest feature that we offer is Pay with Payoneer. Um, we're building out our partner ecosystem. We've just recently launched a partner directory where uh, our sellers can discover, engage, and even pay for partner services. Simply VAT and Skubana are both uh, in this uh, partner directory along with another, a, a growing list of other partners. Uh, what's great about this is that, um, again, you're able to engage uh, one of your partners, utilize your pay and your balances, and make a payment uh, to, uh, to that particular partner and fulfill that obligation. Uh, currently, we're not charging a transaction fee for this service. And lastly, I'm going to go through another uh, very important and new feature that we've just rolled out. Uh, it's the ability to be able to utilize your Payoneer balances to actually um, uh, pay and fulfill your, your VAT obligation. As I described earlier, you can actually engage through our partner uh, directory, uh, simply VAT. Um, and work with them directly and, and actually uh, commission them to help fulfill uh, your, your VAT filing uh, and the obligations therein. And then you can also pay simply VAT uh, for those services. Um, you, can, uh, you can also uh, engage simply VAT to actually make the payment for you on your behalf utilizing your, um, your British pound sterling account balance or uh, you can actually uh, uh, click onto this form. It's a secure form that we've recently uh, created where you can actually pay the HMRC directly um, through instruction from us. So just to sort of summarize, um, the old way in which you know uh, a customer of ours would have had to fulfill their VAT obligation to the HMRC, they would uh, have their British pound sterling account, uh, whatever funds they were collected from Amazon UK, they would transfer back to their US bank and then from there they would have to actually make a transfer or a, uh, a wire or credit card purchase uh, to actually pay the HMRC their, their uh, VAT obligation. Uh, today with this new feature you can actually uh, engage Payoneer to pay directly uh, either your the HMRC um, or we just recently launched um, the ability to be able to pay the German tax authority as well and we're working with other tax authorities to roll this out across Europe as well. And uh, again, thank you very much. Appreciate uh, you joining the, uh, this uh, webinar today and we'll take any questions. I'll push it back over to you, uh, Claire and Alex. Thank you so much. Uh, so I have a few questions here. The first one is Richard. Um, so uh, we have one here. It says, I live in the UK and want to sell into the US. Uh, do I need a US address and bank account? If you, how do I arrange this? That's a great question. So um, the, the beauty of uh, these virtual bank accounts that we offer, these collection accounts, is you do not actually have to have a U.S. address um, to obtain a U.S. bank account. So if you're living in the U.K., you can sign up with Payoneer um, 
as a as a UK business or UK resident, and we will issue um, a Bank of America U.S. bank account that you can use to collect funds uh, locally in in the U.S. Same with the euro. Uh, same with uh, the Japanese yen. Same with Chinese yuan. Thank you. Um, and Claire, I have a question for you. Um, so how does Brexit affect importing goods into the UK? Um, is another EU country better? Um, if, if and when Brexit happens, it means the UK is no longer going to have access to the European single market. But um, there is talk that the UK will keep the VAT system. It will just be too expensive to change it. But also the tax authority does really well out of the revenue. Um, so therefore importing into the UK, we think nothing will really change. Um, it just might take um, slightly longer while um, the tax authority um, upgrades its systems to cope, um, maybe to cope with the, the sheer volume. Um, where it will impact more a non-EU seller, because at the moment many sellers use the UK as a stepping stone into the EU. Like I said, many people use, say, um, Amazon Fulfillment in the UK and then leverage the distance selling rules to get to um, the customers in the other EU countries. But after Brexit, this access will stop, um, will probably stop. I have to say that nobody knows the um, deal, the trade deals that are going to go on the table at this point. But if we do uh, lose access to the single market, sellers are going to have to get into the EU via, um, for example, a country like Germany. Um, so you'll probably still want to access the UK market and then access the EU through another EU country um, like Germany to get to your other EU customers. So it's probably going to be increased cost of compliance, I would say. Perfect. Thank you. Hey, Alex, this is Chad. I know I missed your, your last question. Do you mind repeating it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we know that you're quite a successful seller. So how do you currently operate and where do you currently operate in uh, internationally? So internationally, I'm very focused on scaling on Amazon internationally and along with eBay. So I'm doing eBay, Amazon CA, UK, DE. Uh, I'm starting to look into China right now. Uh, there's other hurdles to, to encounter with China. And then uh, I'm also doing eBay Canada, eBay UK. Uh, and that's really, that's, that's where my focus has been. And um, having Scubana, so how has that helped you grow? And what um, unique features does Scubana have that help you, um, you know, scale your business across borders? Yeah, so like if you look at how we like over year over year, we're adding 87% new SKUs year over year, all of our own brand. So now we have about 3,000 listings across 20 different channels, and to manage that and to micromanage it with spreadsheets, and to try to manually push track information, push inventory, figure out how many to send to FBA, what we're profitable on, all the operation logistics that come with the headache of managing 20 channels and 30 3,000 listings is extremely complex. So I have an outsourced warehouse. I have two, in fact, one internationally, one in Ireland, and one in the United States. Plus, I have FBA warehouses in Germany, UK, in Canada, and I need to properly replenish across all those warehouses, make sure I'm not out of stock. So one of the biggest, I'll give you two big value props. One is automated purchase orders. So instead of having to mine through all your different listings and, and SKUs to see what you need to order, when you need to order it, how many you need to order, with what lead time, Scubana will create you a purchase order waiting approval with a little bow on top. It's like a 24-7, 365 employee. The other thing that I think is a big game changer is the fact that we have SKU profitability. So you can see your profit per SKU across every single channel with every single fee in the mix. So it's not just a one trick, like it's not a one trick pony where we just have a feature where we look at your profitability. We're doing everything, every single fee across every channel and including your cogs across every channel. So those things are like game changers. So when you are, anyone who's on the call is thinking about software, you need to think about how is your software holding you back from growth. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for listening. Um, so we're going to end it here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we can send out a copy if you um, had to sign off. Um, otherwise, yeah, thank you. And I uh, can only apologize for our technical issues. Um, and yeah, thank you and have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks very much. Bye.